Okay, and our final speaker today is Connor Coley. Connor is the class of 1957 career development professor in the departments of chemical engineering and electrical engineering and computer science. He's an expert in computer-assisted chemical discovery and his group develops and uses models to understand chemical reactivity and also to engineer new molecules. So thank you for coming, Connor. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. Um, so thank you all for, for being here and staying until the end, hopefully not a, a bitter one. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about chemistry and about molecules. So we're gonna start by thinking about the small molecule modality. Um, these are the sort of types of structures I tend to think about day to day. Small organic molecules have molecular weights between maybe 50 and 500. They're made up of the familiar, you know, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and a few others. Um, and they exhibit a pretty extraordinary range of functions. So small molecules make up the majority of our therapeutics, but we also use them in agriculture, in material science, and in defense applications. They're an incredibly broad class of structures. Now, of course, what makes you know, Ritalin a good therapeutic intervention for ADHD is very different than what makes DDT, right, a good insect repellent. So I'd like to think about the processes by which we arrive at these structures and how we discover them. Now, one of the reasons why we want to do that and why we want to think about AI and computational assistance is because chemical space is huge, right? This is why we can find structures with such a diverse range of function. It's why there's such an opportunity to find new molecules as therapeutics, among other applications, but it's also a challenge, right? Because we have this extraordinarily large chemical space. There's no way we can look at all of the structures. There's no way we can test all of the structures or even count them. And so we like to think about the use of algorithms and computation to help us navigate this landscape. And so if you're trying to impact human health and drug discovery with AI, there's many different aspects and many different parts of the pipeline to do so. You could work sort of very upstream on the biology. You could work downstream on the clinical side. We like to sort of position ourselves somewhere in between in the early drug discovery stage where you're really focusing on the molecule or on the chemistry. And in this stage, you tend to think about this prototypical design cycle, as it's called, where you iterate through these loops. And inside every loop, you're proposing new molecules that might have good properties, right? They might have the potency, safety, solubility that you want. You're gonna make those molecules, you're going to test them experimentally, and you're going to use that information to inform the next round of design. And maybe it takes dozens of times going through this cycle and hundreds or thousands of compounds to find one or a set of compounds that have the properties you want to then advance into the clinic. And so in the group, we think about all sorts of questions related to accelerating the cycle. We think about connecting molecular structure to function. We think about selecting or designing molecular structures, designing the synthesis of those structures, and analyzing even the outcomes of complex mixtures and trying to understand what's in complex samples. But because we're here to talk about generative AI, one of the places where this comes in most strongly is in design. Right, and thinking about identifying which molecular structures might have the properties we want them to have. And so to start thinking about generative design, I want us to first think about virtual screening, which is sort of the more traditional paradigm and the more traditional way that we might use computation to help us design new structures. People have been building these relationship maps between molecular structure and function for decades, right? This idea was sort of formalized in the 1960s. And so if we have this you know, cartoon landscape where you can imagine changing the molecular structure and having better or worse molecules based on this you know, fitness, again, that could be potency, could be how much it repels mosquitoes, you can query that model with all sorts of structures that you've dreamed up, you know, written down on a whiteboard or enumerated or listed out on your computer. So you can screen these virtual chemical spaces and ask what might the properties be of these candidate structures and then you can simply find the one with the best properties. But now, of course, the promise of generative modeling and of inverse design is it's trying to take this relationship, just as Sergey mentioned, and invert it, right? If we can map structure to function, why can't we map function to structure, right? Can we just take this landscape and directly propose which molecular structures are predicted to exist at these maxima? And this is really the idea behind generative design for molecular design. Now, if we're going to use generative models to make new molecules, one of the biggest things that we have to answer first is, okay, what is a molecule even? How do we think about molecular structures? So when you talk to chemists and you read papers and you look at the slides that I showed you before, you'll see these kinds of line drawings. And of course, images are how we communicate molecular structures, sort of chemist to chemist, but to a computer, we have to be a little bit more intentional about this representation choice. 
So one option would be to represent a molecular structure, this one specifically, as text. There are these languages in cheminformatics where we can represent this molecule as a sequence of characters. And so now a string of characters describes that molecular structure fully. We can also describe it as a graph. We tend to do this quite a lot, so we will represent you know, the carbons, the nitrogens, the oxygens, and how they're connected as a graph. And if we're working in three dimensions, let's say, with an explicit shape, we might think about designing in three dimensions as point clouds, where we have a molecule described as its atoms and those coordinates. And so you might imagine that these choices of representation will influence how we think about generation. Right, in this first example, if molecules are texts, generating a new structure is generating a sequence of characters. If molecules are graphs, generating molecules is generating graphs. Likewise, point clouds. And so these are the choices that we have to make, and all of these have had a number of different approaches and algorithms developed, right, using these, these abstractions. Um, so just a couple of sort of super brief examples. Um, we've worked on a number of different new models and methods for the, these applications for molecular design. Uh, this is an animation showing one that was designed to propose new molecules to serve as protax, proteolysis targeting chimeras, which is a relatively new type of modality designed to bring two proteins together, tag one for degradation, and use the body's natural degradation machinery to decrease the abundance of some protein that we'd like to sort of inhibit or, or decrease the, the prevalence of. And so this protect molecule, we're generating atom by atom because we're treating this molecule as a graph. And so now I'm not claiming this to be a drug, but we have a molecule that's predicted to have some, uh, some performance or some efficacy as, as a protac. We also work in this three-dimensional space, as I mentioned before. So what's guiding generation in this case is actually the shape of the structure. So here we're saying, perhaps I have a molecule that I know fits really neatly into a rigid protein pocket. And so I know the shape of the molecule that I want to achieve. And maybe if I find a new molecule with that shape, it can serve as a ligand and bind to this protein of interest. And so here the query is in blue, this blue mesh, and the molecule that the model invents is in pink. And so you can see that the model is sort of trying to come up with a new chemical structure that approximately fills the volume of the query. So this is a shape conditioned problem now. And we can build a number of different models to, to accomplish this. And again, this has relevance to uh, protein ligand binding when you have relatively rigid protein pockets. And so this is very exciting. And you might imagine that biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies are quite excited about generative design because they're inventing new structures and they're creative and maybe they come up with ideas that we as mere humans could not have come up with. And that's true, but sometimes creativity works against us. And so what happens if you actually apply many of these models in practice inside like a pharmaceutical company is you'll get suggestions of molecular structures that look more or less okay if you're not a chemist on the screen. But you'll notice if you are a chemist, um, very funny structures, really weird balance states, unstable things, just sort of nonsensical ideas that, you know, on the surface, these are reasonable structures, but when you actually think about it, they're not. You can't give this to a chemist to take into the lab and to make them. They're not stable, they're not synthesizable, they're not reasonable. And this is a type of misalignment between, you know, what we're asking our models to do for us and what we actually want to accomplish. It's a very different type of alignment than we usually talk about for AI, right, with safety and ethics, but it's still an alignment issue. The models are doing what we're telling them to do, but it's not actually what we want them to do. And so this challenge of having these structures that are very nonsensical has motivated a lot of other work thinking about how do we take recommendations and learn to figure out if we can make them and how to make them. And so that's really the sort of middle part of this, this design cycle, this design loop is coming up with a recipe for how we make new molecules. This is actually a much older task. Um, people have been working on this since the 50s, of taking a target chemical structure we want to make and using various programs, data-driven and otherwise, to come up with ideas. And so depending on the molecule that we want, we can use these programs to generate recipes. And sometimes it's a dozen, sometimes it's a few hundred or a few thousands, sometimes it's zero, admittedly. But we use these programs, a very different type of generative task, to propose the synthetic process by which we can make our molecules of interest. 
And so recently, something that we've been really focusing on is trying to take this idea of synthesis planning or recipe generation and molecular design and try to merge the two. So that it's not this sort of two-step process, but it's really one integrated look at how we should be designing molecular structures with AI. So I'd mentioned, you know, if we think about molecules as strings, graphs, or point clouds, we have models that generate strings, graphs, or point clouds. But we can also conceptualize molecules as the result of experimental processes, right? This molecular structure is the result of this hypothetical, right, two-step synthesis. And if I represent the molecule in that way, I can think about asking my model, my you know, generative model, to propose a structure in the form of this recipe. So an analogy would be, you know, I can dream up some new, like, cake, right? And I can have this idea of what I want it to taste like, what I want the texture to be, what I want the color to be. But if I do that, I have to then find some sort of expert baker to tell me how to achieve that taste's texture and shape, right? Just like in this, if I come up with a molecule, I have to rely on an expert chemist to tell me how to achieve it. But if I generate instead the recipe, right, all the ingredients, the series of steps, and the operations to bake that cake or to make that molecule, I have it sort of built in, and I know how to make this structure. And so this is exactly um, sort of one of, of a family of models that we've been trying to develop that do this generation of molecular structures in the form of experimental procedures. So we're trying to make sure that our generative models think in the same terms as our experimental capabilities and the actions that are available to us. And so what this sort of looks like, just in a brief animation, is that the model sort of sees a blank slate and it learns to pick commercially available molecules and building blocks just like a chemist would order them and start to run different reactions they know of, and it stitches them together and makes a series of decisions to compose this recipe. And with the molecules that it generates, we can do all the same sorts of scoring and evaluation that we do in, in drug design. We can estimate binding affinities and whatnot. But the point is that we're using generative AI to come up with a new structure that it thinks will perform well. And as a byproduct, we get the recipe. So we're guaranteed that all of the molecules that we get out of this pipeline are in fact accessible according to these recipes that we've designed. And so this is really where I see one of the main roles of generative AI in therapeutic discovery for small molecules at least, is that we use generative AI to help us explore the vastness of chemical space and navigate that 10 to the 60 or 10 to the 80 structures that are possible. But we want to try to align how it thinks with how our chemists have to think and ultimately how maybe robotic synthesis platforms will think, right? We want these things to know what we're able to make in the lab to decrease this uh, sort of gap in our process. And of course, what's next is we have to really show that these are useful not just in a computational setting, but with experimental validation, applications of real therapeutic discovery, and of course, the other aspect is that we have to be able to steer the generative model towards better structures. And so we have to be able to score and evaluate whether those structures are good or not. And so this is um, things that, that are on the horizon for us. But thank you again for, for the chance to share some of this work with you um, and for joining us. Do we have final closing questions? I will right, bring you a microphone. All right, great stuff. Um, so by starting, does it make sense to start with commercially available structures mm -hmm. on a you know, percentage basis? How limiting is that in terms of what's possible? Or is that sort of next to sort of expand the commercially available so that you have more things to try? Yeah, so I'd say that requiring our, ourselves to start with commercially available building blocks, that's sort of the same limitation that exists in the real world. It, it does in some ways limit the types of structures we explore because we try to make sure that the model is running reactions we think we know how to run. So in some sense, applying this gives us this conservative view of what chemical space we can access. If we were completely unconstrained, maybe some of those really wacky looking structures, you know, maybe they could work if there's any way to make them. And so I think that there's a complementarity between this more constrained conservative approach where we want to guarantee accessibility through chemical synthesis and the unconstrained approach where we have this unbounded creativity at the expense of actionability. <laughs>
So they're, they're maybe complementary to each other. Yeah. Thanks. I have a question. Yeah. Which is, um, you know, sort of compared to a pretty good pharmaceutical company yeah. medicinal chemist, yeah. like how good are your models at knowing what reactions will work on the substrates that they're supposed to work on? Yeah, so there, there's a number of like different ways of probing that question. Yeah. Um, so I'd say that right off the bat, we're not making the best synthetic chemists out there better, but we're very much bringing up the, the bottom, we're bringing up the average. We've recently done some benchmark tests um, with some, a panel of medicinal chemists at a pharmaceutical company, not to be named yet, um, and we do find that um, the, the models that we're using to sort of predict that compatibility tends to perform sort of towards the top of, of the bracket if you have you know, a panel of 10 or so chemists. It's definitely like competing with the best chemists they've got. Already. Already. And you're at the beginning, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I found today incredibly enjoyable and stimulating. I hope those of you in the audience did as well. Thank you, Connor, and thanks to the rest of the speakers and the panelists. Yeah. I also want to just take a quick minute to thank um, staff in the biology department who really stepped up a lot to help make this event happen. That's Rebecca Chamberlain, Maggie Cabral, Duyan Cho, Emil Lewis, and um, Sam Adelin. Um, as, as I'm sure many of you appreciate, a lot goes on behind the scenes to see, feed and seat and badge everybody. Thanks also to the AV support and to you for coming. And with that, we'll call it a wrap.